This is the almost timely newsletter for the week of May 28th, 2023. Content authenticity statement, 98% of this newsletter was written by me, the human. You'll see machine-generated content in the examples on uh, the piece on creativity. What's on my mind this week? Can AI truly be creative? Can machines be creative? For years, the artistic community has argued to a great degree of success that machines, artificial intelligence in particular, cannot be truly creative. And this argument has made logical sense largely. After all, think about AI. AI is powered by the data it's trained on, the past data it's trained on, and it draws from that data source to regurgitate the highest probabilities of you know, whatever content you're doing based on prompts. That might be about to change. To dig into this, we first have to understand human creativity. Neuroscience has advanced considerably in the past few decades thanks to tools like functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRIs. Uh, these are scanners which can show what's happening in the human brain in real time as we pursue a variety of cognitive tasks. Things we previously had to guess at or use inaccurate tools like electroencephalographs, which are those crazy wiring setups with all the electrodes that are like stuck all over your head, um, we can now know with much greater precision and accuracy with fMRI scanners. And scientists have been using these new tools to scan the brain uh, and see exactly what's happening inside the brain when we're being creative. So what is human creativity. I'll have a link to the, the full academic study if you want to read it, but recent, fi recent findings have shown that the same mental functions which control memory, uh, particularly memory storage and retrieval in a part of our brain called the hippocampus, are also responsible for creativity. There are three general mechanisms of creativity. The first is you know, more or less daydreaming, where we recall concepts and associations and then uh, sort of glue them together. Uh, as ideas. The second is to sort of flesh out the idea and make it more structured. And then the third part of our brain sort of creates a plan, builds a plan to bring that idea to life. Now, to improve our creativity as humans, the study shows that working on our memory, evoking memories, also improves creativity, especially creative details. They did a whole thing where they had people remember a certain thing, a certain video they watched before, doing, having them doing creativity exercises, and they dramatically improved their creativity. <clears throat> What does this mean? Our memories are the basis for our creativity. If you think about this, this makes completely logical sense too, right? If you ask a, a very young child to paint something they have absolutely no reference for, uh, you'll either get you know thematic nonsense or references to the limited information and life experiences they've already had, right? You ask them to paint you know, Van Gogh's Scream if they've never been to an art museum or seen art online, then they're going to create only the things that they have references for. Memory begets creativity. What's different about human creativity is that memory is very often rooted in emotion. Right? We don't remember things that we have poor emotional connections to. For example, do you remember, do you remember what you had for lunch on December 11th, 2014? Probably not. I certainly don't. I don't even remember what I had for lunch last week, uh, much less something from, you know, what, what, nine years ago. Do I remember what I ate at my wedding, which was now, what, 22 years ago? Yes, I sure do. It was a steak. It was cooked on a grill. It was a choice cut steak. You could tell it was, it was not uh, prime. Um, and it was rare. Like It was cooked really rare. I had ordered medium rare, but, you know, it was this grill was like mounted on the back of this this boat, so you know, not exactly uh, a Michelin star kitchen to work with. Why do I remember one lunch and not the other? Right, one was not memorable because it had no emotional impact, and one had a lot of emotional impact. And emotional impact is one of those things that cements memories in our heads. Our memories for things are that are not rooted in either routine or emotion are essentially faulty. Right, we fail to remember most things that are mundane because they're simply not important, right? What was the color of the last four cars that drove by? I have no idea. Um, these are things that are not worth keeping available in our short-term memory and our conscious memory because they're unremarkable. We do remember things that have emotional impact or are 
highly repetitive and habitual because they never really leave our short-term memory. They never move, migrate out of the hippocampus into somewhere else in the brain. This is, by the way, one of the reasons why I strongly advocate for weekly or even daily email newsletters because it's much harder to build a monthly habit in people's heads, right? It's much harder to get them to to build those habits because uh, go the, the memory of the last newsletter from last month goes into long-term memory if, if any, they remember it at all. And because human creativity is rooted in memory, we create based on our memories and the data we have available to us, knowing it's faulty, knowing it's inaccurate, knowing it's full of mistakes and distortions, but that's okay because those filtered memories are what makes our creativity unique as individuals. My creativity is going to be different than someone else's because I have different emotional connections to my memories. This is in part why AI creates such uncreative stuff. It doesn't discriminate between emotionally impactful training data and training data that's composed of dry, boring stuff, right? It, treat, it treats a, a Tumblr blog that it consumed made entirely of someone's grocery lists with the same semantic and linguistic importance that it treats Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath, right? Think about that. When you we're creating these machine learning models, they're all, they see all this text as essentially the same thing, right? No one piece of text is better than the other. And of course, we know from emotion, there's a difference. Right? When AI goes to create content from that data, it is drawing from probabilities and frequencies as opposed to data filtered through an emotional lens. It has no idea that the majority of the information that's been traded on simply isn't worth remembering. So if creativity, human creativity, is rooted in essentially faulty recall, yay biology, could we simulate that with machines? The answer used to be no. The machine remembers what it remembers. The answer is now yes. There are new AI projects like Dream GPT that are pursuing creativity in a novel way. In normal generative AI, you know, like using Chat GPT or Dolly or Stable Diffusion, we're striving for perfection. We're striving for accuracy, for clarity, for correctness, right? We tell machines not to hallucinate things that don't exist, not to make up facts when they don't know the answer, not to go off the rails in their language generation, right? We rebuke them when, when they draw a picture of a person holding a coffee cup and that person's hand's got like nine fingers and some anatomically impossible gesture. We tell these machines, no, that's wrong. Don't do that. What researchers and developers have realized is that these hallucinations, these mistakes, these inaccuracies, they might be the solution to creativity in machines. The very things we punish normal algorithms for getting wrong might be the gateway to replicating a type of human creativity. For example, suppose I started a sentence like this, which should be familiar to you know, many U.S. and U.K. folks. God save the... In an accuracy challenge, we would punish an AI if it answered anything except king or queen, right? The correct answer, based on most of the data has been trained on, is either God save the king or God save the queen, depending on what time of uh, what period of time you're looking at. God save the rutabaga probably isn't what we're looking for, right? That's a mistake. But suppose you were a creative writer and you had to write a story in which a rutabaga became the king of England, right? It, it's a ridiculous prompt. It's a ridiculous concept. But you probably could write an entire story about it if you're a talented writer. Right? I mean, there's an entire children's series you know, made up of talking vegetables. So it's not that far-fetched a creative prompt. God Save the Rutabaga could be a creative starting point. That mistake that hallucination from a machine could be harnessed as a seed of creativity, which is what projects like DreamGPT have built. Um, you, you download the software, you run it, and you give it a, a starting point. I gave it a prompt of social media marketing and had it intentionally hallucinate some ideas on the topic, and it came up with this one, quantum influencer marketing. Right? This is a quantum-inspired computing system designed for influencers and marketers to help analyze social media campaigns and track metrics. The system will use quantum technology to process large amounts of data and map influencer networks in real time. It goes on for a bit. Does this make a whole lot of sense? Maybe. Maybe not. I mean, quantum computing's power coupled with influencer marketing, is it's an interesting idea. Even if what the computer came up with is kind of nonsensical. But the idea of taking concepts like 
you know, quantum superposition and quantum particle spin as a way to deal with the multiple simultaneous states that an influenced audience could be in, it has some appeal. There's, there's a seed there. There's a bit of reality there. So in other words, as a creative exercise, as a brainstorming session, this output isn't bad. Is it great? No. But is it better than... <laughs> Is it better than what some of our fellow human beings have come up with during corporate brainstorming sessions? Heck yes. Oh my God, corporate brainstorming sessions are the worst. You sit there and just you want to claw your eyeballs out. <clears throat> anyway, um, and this, this technology, it's not great now, but could it be great in a few evolutions? Absolutely. So what does this mean for creative folks? When we dig into creativity and how it works in the human brain and we compare it to how creativity is implemented in the machine's neural networks, we see that the outcomes, combining concepts using selective, maybe even intentionally faulty recall mechanisms, they're growing closer together. We're making significant advances in true machine creativity that more closely resembles human creativity. And it won't be long before machines are as creative as we are. The days of saying that machines can't truly be creative are numbered, and they are dwindling fast. So, what else is happening this week? What else uh, happened this past week? Um, I am pestering folks now uh, on two different ads. Uh, One, Google Analytics 4 is going to be the only game in town in 35 days. So, if you haven't migrated over, uh, hit reply, leave a note in the comments, email me. You need to get that taken care of. Um, and we'll talk about the keynote in a little bit. Um, but I did a piece this week that is worth giving some thought to. It's on the greatest trick that politics played. And this, this piece is not partisan. It's not even scoped to just the USA. It's about how political marketing has substantially damaged society. Watch the piece to find out why. Also talked about DEI and building into AI and why the news industry is really in danger and the answer is not AI. And the answer is news quality. Um, what else we got uh, this week? Also, some new jobs. We have content creator at Maltigo, uh, data and product analyst at Filungo, uh, digital web mobile analytics analyst at Evernorth Health Services, senior e-commerce, uh, key e-commerce analyst at Henry Schein, junior marketing performance analyst at Tavano, marketing and communication specialist at Zeptiv, marketing manager at the Marketing AI Institute, and SEO expert at Filungo. So some really... Uh, good open positions there. Um, the marketing manager position at the Marketing AI Institute, I recommend that one. I know those folks. I know the folks over at the, the AI Institute, and they are fantastic folks to work with. So uh, if that's of interest, uh, go check that one out. The advertisement. Uh, I've been doing a lot of lecturing on large language models this past uh, few months, really, and generative AI. And what I'm realizing is that there's a lot to talk about and more than time permits on you know regular conference keynotes and on the stage. Um, so if you'd like, go watch the, the ad for the video, and you got an email about it recently. Uh, if you would like to bring that talk into your company, do a longer version of it and answer questions that maybe you don't want to ask in public. Other things in the news. TikTok challenging Montana's decision to ban the app. I mean, yeah. Um, ongoing Chinese influence operations could strengthen the case for a TikTok ban. Also, yeah, these know these things are happening um google is expanding the test pool for its new generative ai elements in search uh, they are trying their best to, to keep up there with what's going on with microsoft uh, ai is set to wipe out jobs will also help retrain workers according to reed hoffman um, google's asking for ai regulation which again if you watched last week's newsletter uh, you know exactly why they're doing it if you didn't watch last week's newsletter go Go and watch it. And then on the fun stuff side, uh, there's a fantastic video from one of my favorite YouTube channels, uh, Tasting History with Max Miller, on the history of pizza and what a 500-year-old pizza uh, recipe is like. When, and he shows uh, the making of it and, and the eating of it. And it's basically it's a pastry made of butter <laughs> is essentially what it is. Uh, it's, it's pretty astonishing just how much butter they crammed into that thing. Uh, upcoming events. Uh, 
At the end of July, I'll be at Maycon, the Marketing AI Conference in Cleveland, ISBM's conference in Chicago in September, uh, followed by Content Marketing World, also in uh, September in D.C., and the Marketing Analytics and Data Science Conference, also in D.C., and Marketing Profs B2B Forum uh, here in Boston in October. Some exciting uh, events coming up. The, uh, the subject, no surprise, AI. Uh, but that is the news for this week. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being here. I appreciate your attention. I'm grateful for it, given how many more choices we have to watch and listen all the time. Uh, take care, and I will talk to you next time. If you like this video, go ahead and hit that subscribe button.